am excited to preach, teach, preach, preach. I don't know. I, I got the both. I, I, I don't know what it's going to look like today, but I know it's going to be the Lord. How many can agree with that? And um, it has been a bit since I've been in the pulpit here. I've gotten delayed different times, switched around with the other guys because they were going to be gone, and we had Mexico come in, and I was going to preach that week, and it got moved. And so I, I'm overflowing and ready to ready to preach or teach this morning. I'm glad to be in the in the pulpit with you this morning. Just so you're not worried, I get several outlets throughout the week to be able to uh, preach <laughs> different venues. So everybody's like, "Oh my goodness, this is going to be a two and a half hour one." No. Uh, well, I don't know. We took the clock down because we don't care about time anymore. I hope you're, <laughs> I hope you're on board with us here. We want the Holy Spirit to do what He wants to do, and uh, so we're just going to do that this morning. And I, I want to give some context to what I'm. I've really felt like the Lord wanted me to preach today. Um, so, m- m- how many of you were here last week for Pastor Todd's sermon? Uh, man, tremendous! If not, get online and watch. I. I I say this each time I get up here, but each time these guys get up and speak, it just keeps getting better and better. And you can tell that the Holy Spirit is moving in our hearts, right, in us as leaders. And uh, one of, just a powerful message last week. And I'll make some references to that at some point probably in the sermon. But after leaving last Sunday morning uh, and that wonderful teaching, uh, my Sundays are completely packed right now. And this is the only thing I'm going to say about this, but... Uh, if you if you haven't been to the new Easter pageant, shame on you. You need to go. And I'm not just saying that because I'm involved, but get involved. Go. Not, I'm not even saying work in it. Tomorrow night, Tuesday night, we don't do it on Easter Sunday morning anymore. A sunrise, so you don't have to get up at 5 in the morning, 4.30 in the morning, whatever it was. Monday and Tuesday night, 7 o'clock, free tickets at the Y. You can Doors open at 6. Come. It's a great way. Bring somebody that doesn't know the Lord. It's a great way for us to share the gospel. But on Sundays, I leave here after church. I run home. I grab lunch real quick, and then I have to be at uh, an Easter pageant practice. And so I was leaving Easter pageant practice last Sunday night, Pastor Todd, and, and I was on my way home, and I was praying through just what the word of the Lord was, and I was just really soaking it in and, and praying, and the Lord began to, to download some things. I was like, God, what's because Pastor Todd talked about we all, we all have cracks, right? We have these things that we leak oil. And we're not, when we talk about brokenness, brokenness is a good thing in Scripture in some ways. The Bible says in, in the book of Psalms, uh, he, King David wrote that a broken and a contrite spirit that the Lord, the Lord will not despair. He will not turn away from. He loves brokenness. We're not talking about that kind of brokenness. We're talking about areas in our lives that need to be sealed up where he needs to bind up the broken hearts in us. So we're not, uh, the, what we get on Sunday, we're not running out on Tuesday and we're going, you know, I'm a heathen again. You know what I'm saying? This was, it was a great sermon. It was great. You need to go back. I'm not going to try to re-preach it. But I was praying through that. And, and the Lord, uh, he began to, to speak to me directly about uh, the early church and what made them so effective. And he said, Lucas, I want, you to, I want you to go. I want you to look into the early church and what, what, was, what was the cause for their success. And and, and this may be a little bit more teachy than preachy this morning, I, but I promise it's going to hit you where you're at because what was good for the early church is good for... We shouldn't be any different than it was in the book of Acts. Hello, somebody. So what was good for the early church is good for us. Look at your neighbor and say, it's good for you. So I, w- I was praying through that, and, 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 and I'm like, God, what does this have to do with you know, where Pastor Todd was preaching, and, and uh, one, I kind of felt reprimanded, didn't, you don't have to worry about that, it's the Holy Spirit, so you just follow me, and so I, I've been, I've been doing that this week, and, and so I really go, I did this kind of deep dive thing into, in a little bit ways of, of what was successful for the early church, and what is interesting, I'm just setting all this up so I can preach, is everybody okay, nod your head, okay, he, on, uh, throughout the week, so this, on Monday, uh, I, 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 the day off from work, and so I spent the day just in study, you know, and <clears throat> I think it was Wednesday of last week, Pastor Todd sent to us a clip of the last prophetic, public prophetic message that Kim Clement gave while he was here on the earth. If you don't know who Kim Clement is, Kim Clement was 
uh, he, he, he passed away in 2016, but he was a world-renowned prophet. Now, some of you get wigged out when I just say that somebody's a prophet. Stop. They're here. We have one in our church. Hello. Uh, there's five-fold ministries, Ephesians, apostles, they exist, prophets, they exist, pastors, evangelists, teachers, they exist. Why is it that we believe you can have a pastor, but you can't believe you have a prophet? Come on, somebody. I, I, I'm not going there. But there's a, Kim Clement was a very powerful prophet, and I don't need to give any, I don't need to glorify, I'm not glorifying a man, but God used him in very strong ways. He saw things that nobody else saw before they happened, and it was for a purpose. But he passed away in 2016. In 2015, in the fall, he gave what was his last public prophetic message to the church. And it happened to be in California. And, and in September of 2015, he gave a message. He gave a prophetic message. And I, I'm not going to share this clip. I, I was going to, and I'm just going to give it to you. I'm not going to give you the whole thing. I'm just going to give you a nutshell because I was hearing it, and it was about an hour long, this video that Pastor Todd sent, and I didn't get to listen to it right away. I was at work, so I can't just, like, take an hour out of work, you know, and listen and the way my job works, and so I listened to it some point later, but again, all this is the Lord is speaking on Sunday night. He's all day Sunday he's speaking to me about the early church, and then Kim Clement in this prophecy in 2015, so unbelievable, almost nine years ago this September. He gives this word. He said, there are many churches that are being crucified between two thieves. On one side, the thief is an erroneous religious system that has put laws in place, man-made structures in place that they can never keep to. And on the other side, the other thief is secular humanism. In other words, you can just do, do whatever feels right to you. He said, there are churches being crucified. The, 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 the global church, many of the global church is being crucified between two thieves. A religious system made by man, I don't want religion, and human secularism. Just do whatever you, you feel is right. Churches are dying between two thieves, he said. And then he said, but right now, the church of Jesus Christ, the remnant, is in the, is in the beginning stages of a reformation and a recovery. Woo, this is 2015. He said, right now, we are in the beginning stages of a reformation of the church and a recovery. And he said, a recovery of what? A reformation of what? He said, of apostolic Christianity. Now, people get weirded out by that too. People hear apostolic Christianity and they go, oh, I don't like apostolic churches. Stop. That's, that, that is not what apostolic Christianity is. You want to know what apostolic Christianity is? Read the book of Acts. That's apostolic Christianity. Our leadership team here is called the A team. That's what we call ourselves, the A-team. Not because we like B.A. Baracus, but pity the fool. I love, I love me some B.A. Baracus. I love the A-team. And like, I love it when a plan comes together. Cigar. I love the A-team. That was a cool show, man. We don't call ourselves the A-team because we like B.A. Baracus. We call ourselves the A-team because it stands for apostolic team. If you read the book of Acts, in, in the book of the, the, the church where they were first called Christians was in the city of Antioch. You couldn't tell who the pastor was. I love it. You don't know. So if you're a visitor here today, this is probably the first time you've seen me. If you haven't been here in the last, if you just started coming six weeks ago, you're like, who's this guy? I love that. I love it. We have an apostolic team. And, 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 and Kim Clement prophesied, he said, he could see, he said, right now. We are in the middle of an, uh, the church reformation and recovery of the ap apostolic Christianity. And then he said this. He said, for some reason, the church has skipped over the simple in search of the sensational. When he said that, Pastor Todd, I was like, are you kidding me right now? It was like I would... I had already, I've been doing this deep dive study into the early church, and then he goes, we cannot skip the simple in search of the sensational. God bless the miracles. Woo! I'm all about signs and wonders. I, I love it when people are like, I got oil coming out of my hands. I see gold dust. I'm all about the fire of God falling. But we cannot be in search of those things and skip over the simple things. See, the reformation, the recovery that is happening in the church of Jesus Christ is not, yes, there's going to be signs and wonders. Those things follow us when we believe. 
And believing comes down to simple things. I, I, I don't follow signs and wonders. They come after me. Wherever I go, I preach the gospel. There comes the signs and wonders. We got too many people that are like, where's the signs? They're chasing signs. Stop chasing signs. We will not be a church, and, I, and this is somewhat of my role, I think, in our house. I know I'm called to pastor, and so I love it when I can get in the pulpit and I can shepherd. We will not be a house that will chase signs. We are not going to be a house that will search after the sensational, and I don't believe that we are. I'm not saying this because, as a warning because we are. I'm saying going forward, remember this. We are going to remember what got the church where it is. And it was not the sensational. I'm going to show you in some scripture some powerful things that the Lord revealed to me this week in terms of not skipping over the simple. And, and, and when he said reformation and recovery of the ap apostolic Christianity, I was like, when you sent that, I was like, you had no, and then I never responded. I was like, that was in 2015. Here I am in 2024, and the Lord says, you need to, I want you to go into the early church to look at the early church. And so I, I started looking into this, and, and bear with me. You're going to get some, some things this morning. I'm, I may cover a lot of Scripture, but I want you to grab the nuggets that you can out of this. When I started really diving into the, into, to the early church, one of the things that I found that is fascinating about the growth of the early church, and, and I've, I've titled this today. I didn't, sometimes titles come to me, and they're really cool and fancy. There was this one's not. This one just is whatever. This is, I want to talk about growing the kingdom of God biblically. Okay? Notice I said growing the kingdom of God. We're not growing Bethel Worship Center. We're not building a building. We're building a body. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm not interested in building a church. I'm interested in building Christ. Hello? We're not about building castles. We're about building kingdom. So when I'm talking about growing the kingdom of God, I'm talking about in our region, we are, what is our responsibility as a church, as a body, a local body of Christ to grow the kingdom of God? What does it look like? And so the Lord was really speaking to me. And I, when, when I look at the early church, you're going to get some information here. You're probably not going to remember this, but it matters to me. So it's going to matter to you this morning. Cool? <laughs> Jesus died around AD 30 the year 30. So literally, Jesus steps on the scene and time splits in two. Before the year zero, time counted down. You know, we went down in time. So there was 200 BC, 100 BC, zero. Jesus shows up somewhere in that range. And he dies somewhere in the year 30 to 33. We know he was 33 years old. We just don't know. He may have been here before the zero happened, but either way, at some point when they started keeping time in a calendar, they said, Jesus was so powerful. Jesus was such an impact on the world that we got to split time when he showed up. I like that. He dies around AD 30, 33, somewhere in there. And when you look at the rapid growth of the church, the kingdom of God, from that point forward, it is insane. Let me just give you something. So I was reading, again, sometimes I read a lot of stuff. Tertullian was a Christian author who lived in the late second century. Now, some of you get heart, when, when do you, does everybody know what century we're in right now? Most of you are like, uh, we're in the 21st century. That jacks with some of you because it's 20. 24, but we're in the 21st because from zero to 100 was the first century, okay? And you go, what in the world? I have never been at Bethel Worship Center and had this kind of sermon. Hang with me. Zero to a 100 was the first century. From 100 to 200 was considered the second century. Tertullian was a Christian author who wrote and lived in the second century, and he wrote this around the year 180 A.D., so 150 years after Christ died, from 30 to 180, and Tertullian is writing, he lives in a Roman, Roman province, and Tertullian writes, we are but of yesterday. In other words, we were, we, it was just almost like yesterday that we came on the scene. We are but of yesterday, and we have already filled your, we've already filled your schools, in a sense, I, I won't say everything he said, 
because he won't make sense to you. We've already filled your schools. We've already filled your government. We've already filled your theaters. We've already filled your workplaces. The only places that we've left to you are your temples. In other words, in 150 years, Christianity was that widespread that it was overcoming the Roman government. Now get this, get this. In the 4th century, in the year 313 A.D., so another 140 years, 130 years, comes on the scene the Roman Emperor Constantine, who is a faithful follower of Christ. And he makes it Roman law that Christianity is now the official state religion. Some of you are going, big deal. Oh, it's a real big deal. Because when Jesus died and the church was birthed, the Roman government was hanging Christians on poles and lighting them on fire for parties. The Roman government was persecuting Christians at an insane rate. They were feeding them to lions. Christians were dying every single day all over the Roman government. And just in a few short years, and you say, that's not a few short years. A couple hundred years is not a, yes, it is. It's a blink of an eye, right? It doesn't take long to go 200 years. In a couple generations, all of a sudden, the church has consumed the world enough that the Roman government, the Roman Caesar is like, you know what? The official state religion now is Christianity. We're going to worship Jesus. Somebody, that, that, I'm going to tell you what in the world would cause the church to grow at such an amazing rate. And how does that apply to me today? Because I'm going I'm to be honest with you, when I look at culture today, it doesn't feel like the church is as dominant as it was then. And I, I'm, I'm praying, th- now mind you, all this is I'm praying through what Pastor Todd was preaching. He said, Lucas, look at the early church. And so I, let me give you just five real quick things that the Lord spoke to me about. Why is it that the, the, there was such rapid growth of Christianity in the early church, and what are these principles? Number one, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Oh, my goodness. Can I just take a few moments, because I'm in the middle of teaching a supernatural church class. There's my plug for that. If you haven't taken it, you need to take it in the fall. You need to know what you believe. You need to know what we believe. So, I, can I just take a few moments? In, in John chapter 20, I think I gave you guys this. I was hesitant to go there, but I want to read it anyway. In John chapter 20, verse number 19, it says this. Now, let me give you context to where we are starting here. Jesus has been crucified, and then he has been raised. This is Sunday night. He just got up Sunday morning. The first people to, to get to the tomb it happened on Sunday morning. And the Bible says in verse number 19 of John chapter 20, I don't know if you guys got that or not. If not, you can hang with me. There we go. In John chapter 20, verse number 19, then the same day at evening being the first day of the week. So we know that this is the very same day that Jesus has come out the tomb. The same day at evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace be with you. Stop for just a moment. The disciples are gathered in a room for what? For fear of the Jews. Oh boy. This didn't work out like we thought it was going to work out. We thought Jesus was setting up a kingdom on the earth and now we just watched him die a brutal death and saw him in a tomb. They are out their minds, crazy, panicked fear. To the point where they have locked themselves in a room for fear of death. And all of a sudden, doors locked and everything, walks Jesus. Straight through the door. But he's not a ghost. He's not a spirit. He says, peace be unto you. In fact, he proves it to him. Give me something to eat. Can a spirit eat? And they watch him eat. He said, touch my hands, touch my side. They're like, whoa, 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 this isn't a spirit. This is a real dude right now. And he just walked through a door. They thought they were scared before. Now they're really scared. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. They were overwhelmed. Here is Jesus, the one that they had followed for three years, and he walks through the door, and he says, peace be unto you. And these guys are like, they, are, they, are, they have sheltered themselves in, and they're like, we missed it. We didn't know who we thought he was who he was, but we missed it. That's what they're thinking. We were wrong. They may have been even going, he must have led us astray. We were following a myth. We were following a lie the whole time. Oh, my goodness. 
These guys who just a few moments, uh, you could go three weeks back and they were, they were with Jesus and the heads held high and laying hands on the sick and now they're sheltered in a room going, we missed it. He led us astray. Jesus walks through the door and he says, peace be to you. And when he had said this, verse 20, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them, peace to you as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And then there is this verse, 22. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. This right here is what we know as salvation. When he said, when he breathed on them, do you know that Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 says that God, when God picked up dust in his hand, that he, he breathed into it and the dust became a man and it lived? There was life in it? There's something about when God breathes in something, right? Life comes to it. I could give you Ezekiel chapter 37. When God comes to Ezekiel and he says, son of man, can these dry bones live? He said, prophesy to the breath from the four winds. And Ezekiel gets up on his heels and he says, from the north, from the south, from the east of the west, breath of God blow over these bones. And what happens? The breath of God blows over dead things and they come to life. At this moment in the scriptures, those that were dead, do you realize that they could not be saved until this moment right here? What we know as salvation could not take place until Jesus died on a cross. And he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And he, at that moment, they are made new. And they, are one, they were spiritually dead before, and now they are spiritually alive. Come on, somebody. Now, we can get excited about that, and I thank God for salvation. If you're in the room, that's why we believe, we don't believe at all, that you have to speak in tongues to be saved. I'm going to get there in just a second. When you get saved and you surrender your life to Jesus, you get all the Holy Spirit you need right there. I've said it this way a hundred times. We have all the Holy Spirit we need. We have all of the Holy Spirit. He just doesn't have all of us. (laughs) And... He says, this is interesting, because this is, when this takes place, this is 50 days before Pentecost, the Acts chapter 2 experience. They already received the Holy Spirit, Todd. And then he says directly after this, in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 and 8, and being assembled together with them, this is 40 days after what we just read, he commanded them to not depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but in a few days you shall be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Woo. And then verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth, to Judea, to Samaria, to the ends of the earth. I like this. Hang with me. He says in John 20, receive the Holy Spirit, and he blows on them. (sighs) They get saved. And then he says, don't leave Jerusalem. That's just the first part. He said there's coming a baptism. The Holy Spirit at that moment when he breathed on them, (sighs) received the Holy Spirit. At that moment, the Holy Spirit baptized them into the body of Christ. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says. You're getting some of this. You're going to take the class later. You'll get this. At that moment, the Holy Spirit baptizes the church. He baptizes the disciples into the body of Christ, and they become the church. But he said, that's not it. He goes, there's one more baptism. There's one more thing that needs to happen. In a few days from now, I'm going to turn around and baptize you in the Holy Spirit. You guys know the rest of the story. Acts chapter 2, they're gathered in an upper room. And when they're gathered in that upper room in one mind and one accord, the Bible says that a mighty wind blew through the room called the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, call him whatever you want. Well, don't call him whatever you want. Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. There's many names for him. Spirit of truth, spirit of righteousness, spirit of wisdom, whatever. It's all through Scripture. The Holy Ghost blows through the room. And the Bible says that he set on each one of them like tongues of fire. Now listen. Listen. He doesn't say in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you're going to speak in tongues, you're going to prophesy, you're going to do, you're going to, all those things were going to happen. What does he say? He says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power. All of a sudden, in an upper room, 
in Jerusalem where they had waited for 10 days, 120 of them. It started as 500, 380 of them said, you know, day seven, I, I th some of them were like, I'm out. Day eight, they're like, man, I'm hungry. Day nine, they're like, I got things to do. But the 120 that stayed in an upper room, sweaty, hot, sticky, probably going, you know what, I'm just about sick of Peter right now. Matthew's like, oh my goodness, I can't do this any longer. And they're gathered, but they're in one mind and they're one accord. We're going to stay because Jesus said to stay. There's something else for us. We're saved. We know it. We know that he's the Messiah now because we've got this confirmation on us that he is the one true God. But we're going to stay. And on that 10th day, waiting in an upper room, here comes the Holy Spirit. And they begin to speak in new languages. What am I saying? When they walked out of that upper room, they begin to preach in the streets. These are the same men that I just read to you just just 50 days earlier, we're, tr we're locked up in a room saying there's no way we can do anything. We've missed it. He's lied to us. We followed a myth, and if we go outside, they're going to kill us. To now they're in the streets of Jerusalem preaching about the Messiah and saying Jesus is the way, and you crucified him. Here's these dudes. What is, what is going on here? I'm going to tell you one of the first things. The reason why the church grew so rapidly is because there was a boldness. There was a power that came over the church and the power of the Holy Spirit to do what Jesus did while he was here. And that is still true for us today. I hope somebody else from other churches reads this or sees this sermon. Listen, we cannot give up on the power of the Holy Ghost. We will never reach this city. We will never grow the kingdom of God in this region without the power of the Holy Ghost empowering us to do something. And I'm not just talking about tongues. I love the little meme that's going around, or it's been going around for a while now. I don't do Facebook. Sorry, I don't do social media. I cannot stand it. And I'm not knocking you if you do. There are some good things with it. But I did see something, it's probably been months ago, on Facebook where it said, the Holy Ghost don't come upon you just to keep you, just to make you speak in tongues. He also comes upon you to forgive. He also comes upon you to repent. He also comes upon you to, to treat your neighbor like you, you, yourself and to love like Jesus loved. We need the Holy Ghost empowerment to grow this church and to grow the kingdom of God. Nothing has changed from 2,000 years ago when the church was birthed. Jesus said, wait in Jerusalem. Why did they have to wait? Because he said, you cannot do and you cannot build my kingdom if the Holy Ghost doesn't empower you. And I'm tired of churches getting ashamed. And I'm tired of churches backing away and shying away from the truth of the Holy Ghost. I need him every day. I need him. I don't need a, <laughs> don't call him an it. The baptism in the Holy Ghost was an it. But I'm talking about communion with the person, the Holy Spirit. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The only reason I can get up here in this pulpit and preach any lick at all is because of the power of the Holy Spirit. The only reason that we can glorify God and we, we have a great worship team is because of the power of the Holy Spirit. The only way we're going to reach a community that needs to be saved, they need to be redeemed, they need to hear the love of Jesus is through the power of the Holy Spirit. That has not changed. And I'm just declaring today that in our church that is not going to change. We are going to rely completely on the power of the Holy Ghost. Do you, I think it was D.L. Moody said that it's easier for a, a man to breathe without air than it is for a Christian to live without the Holy Ghost. Let me say it for you one more time. It is easier for a man to breathe without air. Try that one time. <laughs> it's easier for you to breathe without air than it is for a Christian to live without the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, it's impossible to live the Christian life like Jesus called us to live it without the power of the Holy Ghost. Say amen. What caused the rapid growth of Christianity in the early church? The empowerment of the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. Number two, their commitment to prayer. I've noticed this. Let, let me, can I just read you? I didn't give you guys this. Let me, can I just read you a few verses? Let me say this. In the book of Acts, prayer is mentioned 
30 times, I believe, almost 30, maybe 29 times, more than any other book in the New Testament. There's 28 chapters in the book of Acts. You can't go one chapter without reading about prayer. You want to know why the church grew? Because they prayed. You know what I noticed in the last few months when we started the new year? We, we started fasting and we started praying. And I, it wasn't just in this room. I'm not talking about what you do here. In fact, I'm more talking about what you do at home. I'll be the first one to tell you. When we did the prayer initiative and we did the fasting thing, we went from the beginning of February through the end of uh, February, actually into March, whatever. There were, we were here every night. Worship every night, worshiping and praying, mainly praying. I went to four of them. Wow, geez, shame on you. Don't talk to me like that. I don't feel any shame in that at all. I understand, I, and I had, to make ex I had to make exceptions to get here for the four. That didn't mean I wasn't praying at home. <laughs> in fact, I'm more talking about not what you do in the room. Some of you are great at praying when you're in the room. How about you go home and pray? Acts chapter 1 verse 14, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. Acts chapter 2 verse 42, every believer was faithfully devoted to the following the teachings of the apostles. Their hearts were mutually linked to one another, sharing communion and coming together regularly for prayer. Acts chapter 4 verse 23, I love this. this is, Peter, and, Peter and John have just been arrested and said, dude, you can't talk in Jesus' name anymore. You can't. We're going to flog you, beat you, kill you. As soon as they were released from custody, Peter and John went to the other believers and explained all that had happened with the high priests and the elders. And when the believers heard their report, they raised their voices in unity and prayer. I dare you to stop me. As they prayed, oh my goodness, the earth shook beneath them, causing the building where they were in to tremble. Each one of them was filled with the Holy Spirit, and they proclaimed the word of God with unrestrained boldness. This is not Acts chapter 2, this is Acts chapter 4. Here they are filled again. How did it happen? They prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed some more. Well, I struggle with prayer. Talk to him like he's your best friend, because that's who he is. Hello? Some of, you, some of you get so worried about what prayer looks like. Oh, my God, it's a relationship with him. He loves you. Some of you need to be quiet in prayer. You talk too much. I almost said, turn to your name and say, shut up. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. You need to be quiet when you get in relationship with God because I'm going to tell you what. He's going to download some things into you that you need to hear. You want to know why the church grew so rapidly and so quickly? Because people were praying, and I noticed it. I noticed it from the new year to now. There was something that was brewing in the atmosphere. That didn't just happen. It happened because there were people getting together and going, let's seek the face of the Lord for me and for my house and for our church and for our community. I don't think that needs to stop. It doesn't need to stop corporately, and it better not stop in your home. Can I tell you, without prayer, the early church was wondering and wondering. Without prayer, the early church just would have been wandering, with an A, uh, aimlessly around with no sense of purpose and no sense of direction. But when they prayed, the Lord would say, go here. And when, the pray, when they prayed, God would say, this is your purpose. This is what I wanted you to do. They were wandering without prayer, and they would have been wondering, I wonder if God loves me. I wonder if he really did raise from the dead. I wonder if I really do have purpose. I wonder if I, you don't deal with that when you're in relationship and prayer. Oh, you might have moments, but when you get into your prayer closet and you get in relationship with God and you listen to what he wants to tell you, guess what he tells you? I love you. I'm proud of you. You do have purpose. I got a plan for you, you know what I'm saying? You're in your prayer time. You're struggling with, I just don't know what God wants me to do. I just don't, I don't feel like I have any purpose. You get into your prayer time, and the Lord says, girl, I got a plan. Would you just trust me? Would you let me lead you? Prayer. It matters. It still matters. You know what? We used to have prayer meetings all the time back in the day. Some of you older than I am, I know somebody's going, there's somebody older than, no. yeah, there's plenty of people older. I'm like 32. There's <laughs> plus a few. There's some of you older than I am. You remember all night prayer meetings. 
I'm not saying we need to go back to that, but I do think prayer needs to be the first, needs to be one of the initiatives that we continue to do. Because it's prayer that the Lord downloads what we need, where we're going, and he gives us instruction. We, our apostolic team doesn't take it lightly. We are prayerful about, God, where do you want us to lead this body? What do we need to do to reach people for the kingdom of God? Well, that doesn't, we can't get those instructions without prayer. They had a commitment to prayer, and it was, they stuck to that commitment. The third reason that the church grew so quickly is, I want to say, lifestyles of humility and compassion. You know what rubs me the wrong way quicker than anything? When I see somebody that is a believer that claims Jesus, and they're so arrogant and prideful it makes me sick. Oh, man, it it rubs me the wrong way. Because that's not who I see in Jesus at all. If anybody had a reason to be prideful, Jesus did. He's a king. He created the people that he was around. And yet he said, he he said, of any among you, Jesus said this in Mark chapter 10. He said, you know, guys, he said how the rulers of this world, they lord their power over the people underneath them. And the government officials, they flaunt their authority for those that serve under them. And the disciples are like, yeah. And he goes, not going to be the way with you. And if you decide to be a leader, and if you want to be a leader, you better humble. You're going to humble yourself, and you're going to be a servant first. If you want to be first, you better learn to serve everybody else first. And then he said, because even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and give his life as a ransom for many. That's what it looked like to be Jesus. You, the reason why it was so attractive to people, the early church was so attractive, is because they lived lifestyles of humility and compassion. Do you know that in Roman times, which is exactly when the church was birthed, Rome Rome was the prevailing government. Roman, uh, all their gods, everything, how they saw people was very, very um, barbaric. Did you know that in Roman culture, a baby when it was born was not considered a human until they could actually start speaking? And so what would happen is when a baby was born, especially little girls, especially little girls, they would lay that baby at the feet of the father. If the father wanted it, he would, take, he would pick it up, and it would be allowed into the home. If he didn't want it, he left it there. They would put the baby outside of the home and hope somebody took it. Sound like America? There better be a stark difference between the culture that we live in and how we treat children. I'm telling you how we treat one another. The Roman culture, the Jewish culture, valued women little, sometimes less than an animal. What made the early church different is because they believed that every child, every child was called by God because God had formed them in their mother's womb. And they valued the life of the child. That was unique. And all these people in the cities and all these people in these Roman provinces were like, wait a minute, that church, that group of even they didn't even know that it needed to be a church, that, that, that it was even called a church. That group of people that meets, they treat, they treat children differently. That group of people that meets, they treat women differently. Do you realize that the first people to find out that Jesus rose from the dead were women? Do you realize the first evangelist in Scripture was a woman? Oh, and I got, I got some feminists in the room that are like, yes, girl, pal, I'm not talking about feminism. I'm talking about Jesus valued every single person. And it wasn't that I, I, I'm not going to give value over a man, over a woman. Every single one of us, women, you can do things that I cannot do. You will love in ways that I cannot love. And men, we are called to do things that women can't do. There is nothing wrong with that. I happen to work with a female every single week, every single day. There are certain things that she cannot do physically that I can. That doesn't make her less than me. Hello, somebody. And in that time, the Romans were going, yeah, you women, you just need to stay to the side. While the the church was going, no, you have value. Women were prophesying. Do you realize that out of the 120 that were in the upper room, a good portion of them were women? They received the same Holy Spirit, the same baptism in the Holy Spirit as the men did. Hello? Hello? This this lifestyle of of humility and compassion, people saw that the church cared for one another. 
Can I read you a passage of scripture? In Acts chapter 4, verse 32, all the believers were in one mind and heart. Selfishness was not a part of their own community, for they shared everything they had with one another. Same, some who owned houses or land sold them and brought the proceeds before the apostles to distribute to those without. Not a single person among them was needy. Do you realize that the church, they cared for one another? They genuinely cared. Listen, if somebody's got an issue in the house, we want to know about it so the body can come alongside you and care for you. That's what family does. Now, I will say this because I've already preached it just a few months ago that we cannot know if, you're not, if you don't share what you're going through. Some of you are like, well, the Holy Spirit will reveal it to him. Maybe he won't. Maybe he's waiting on you to tell somebody that you're going through something so there can be a grace for you to go through it. We're the body. We want to be able to help. We want to care for one another. And not just the church didn't just care for one another. It'd be easy to care for the people that you loved and care for the people that are in the family. But the church, all of a sudden, they started seeing, you know what, they're actually, they're actually reaching out to the disenfranchised. They're actually loving the ones that nobody would love. They're actually reaching down and touching lepers. They're actually reaching out to beggars, and they're saying, hey, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. Wow, that's unique. That's countercultural. Because the ones that were less than, they got forgotten. But the church, Jesus said, you're not going to forget the, the ones forgotten. You're not going to forget the outcasts. You're going to love them. What made it so rapid, what made it grow so rapidly is people went, they're different from the culture that they're living in. There's a lifestyle of humility, a lifestyle of compassion. Four, I got two more. What caused the, the rapid growth of the church, the kingdom of God in the early first and second century, fearless devotion. The same men that were locked in rooms, afraid to die, all of a sudden were like, I don't even really care if I die. Wow. <laughs> if you get a chance sometime, get the passion translation, read Stephen's address to the Sanhedrin and Pharisees and the religious ones in, in Acts chapter 7. He's not an apostle. You know what Stephen has done? Stephen was just a guy that waited on tables. He served food to the ones who didn't have food. He worked in, if you will, he worked at the mission. He worked at the place where people would come that didn't have a meal. And Stephen served them. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes upon him in Acts chapter 7. He gets up outside of that mission, and he starts preaching. He said, I know I just serve food, but I got something on the inside of me. And he starts preaching, and <laughs> man, he goes after it. It's good. I bet if I read it here today, it would probably cause some uneasy feelings. I'm not going to read it because it's a long sermon. He preaches, and the Bible says that the religious people got so angry and filled with rage that they gnashed their teeth at him. And they, they, the Bible says they pounced on him, and they drug him out the city, grabbed stones and started stoning him. And he's like, that's cool, man. The Bible says he looked up into heaven and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is normally seated. But when one of his ones is being persecuted and is about to come home, Jesus stands up. He says, come on home, Stephen. And Stephen said he looked up. The Bible says Stephen looked up and he saw, he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. He said, don't hold him against him, Lord. I'm coming home, but don't hold this sin against them. He wasn't afraid to die. I could keep going. James, the brother of John, the sons of thunder, was beheaded. We find it in Acts chapter 10. The church is scared, and they've arrested Peter. Peter's next on the, on the list. But Jesus is like, now Peter ain't done yet. And the church, guess what the church did? They, <laughs> it's a great story. Peter's laying in prison, and, the, and an angel hits him on the side. Get up. It's time to go. He was guarded by 16 soldiers, the Bible says. The Bible says he walked by the first two. And then he walked by the second two, two by two, until he walked all the way out the city gates. The door opened automatically, the Bible said. The gate opened right in front of him, and he was like, he thought he was dreaming. He gets all the way outside the city gates, and all of a sudden, the angel leaves him, and he goes, what? he goes, oh, man, this, this ain't a dream. This was real. And so he goes to the house, the house church, where they're meeting, and they're actually in prayer meeting, praying for Peter to be released. And he goes over to the door, and he says, 
And a girl named Rose comes to the door. And Rose, Rose is so excited because she hears Peter's name. She's, Peter's outside saying, hey, let me in. And Rose is so excited that it's Peter that she doesn't even open the door. Rose runs back to the prayer meeting. She says, guys, you're not going to believe it. Peter's outside the door. The thing that we've been praying for, the Lord has heard us, and he's knocking at the door. And the church is so full of faith that they're like, Rose, stop. It's probably just his, his spirit. He's like, she's like, I, I, no, I mean it. He's, he's out there. And I'm like, Rose, <laughs> that would be impossible. He's guarded by 16 guards. He's going to be killed tomorrow. And Rose is probably thinking, why are we praying then? <laughs> And she's there to appease her. They go to the door. And when they open the door, there's Peter in the flesh. He doesn't die for several more years. The Lord restored. The Lord brought Peter out of prison because people pray. But here's the thing. Peter wasn't afraid to die. Peter's like, uh, you know, if this is it, I could read, to, I could tell you the stories of every single one of the apostles, how they died, except John. They tried to kill John multiple times, but they just couldn't get it done because John had to receive a revelation <laughs> on an island of Patmos. Every single one of these guys gave their lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The same men that were hiding in a room. Why? Because they were fearlessly devoted to the point that martyrdom didn't matter. Because you can kill the body, but you can't kill the soul. And they knew something. Paul talked about it like this. To be absent from the body is to be present for the Lord. To live is Christ, but to die is gain. Come on, somebody. And you're going, Pastor Lucas, Pastor Lucas. You're surely not going to go to this point in your sermon. You're like, if somebody walked in right now with a gun and they put a gun to your head, what would you do? I'm not going to do that. Because I used to hate that when I was a kid. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I don't know. I was like, I got cold steel to my head. I, I, I mean, I would hope. I pray we never have to go through that. What's my point? I'm saying we are in a season. We are in a culture right now where there is going to be intense persecution. I'm not saying this to scare you. But I'm saying this that you've got to decide right now who are you devoted to. You better know what you're believing, and you better know beyond a shadow of a doubt. It doesn't matter what kind of persecution I go through. They can make fun of me. They can talk about me like a dirty dog. My friends can turn their back on me. I'm not turning my back on Jesus. That kind of devotion without fear. And when the, when the people outside the church saw a church like that, you know, it's one thing. It's one thing to believe in a Messiah, okay, let them have that. But when they're willing to go to a stake and burn, when they're willing to be horse-drawn and quartered because of their faith, there must be something to the faith. You know what a world is looking for? Our world is looking for people that are sold out completely. They're not looking for wishy-washy Christians. Because I'm going to tell you what, gone are the days where we serve God on Sunday and we live like however we want on the, the days between. Those days are over. Now, the people, the, the world needs to see believers that are sold out and they're fearlessly devoted on Monday, on Tuesday. And it doesn't matter what the government says. It doesn't matter what the, what the community says. It doesn't matter what their friends say. It doesn't matter what their family says. I'm going to serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we're going to serve him. It caused a rapid expansion of the gospel of Jesus Christ because these guys would die for it. Last, the last point, why, and, I, I, and I'm bringing this around. How in the world does this apply to what Pastor Todd was preaching? This is where it started for me. The reason why the church grew so rapidly is because there was a consistency between their beliefs and their behaviors. The reason why people don't come to church now, a good portion of people don't come and will never step foot in a church, is because they've seen Christians outside the church. Oh, man, if that's how a Christian is, I don't want to be a part of that body. There has to be a consistency between what we believe and how we behave, what we do. If there's not consistency, that's called hypocrisy. And you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, be holy as I'm holy. That was a statement about hypocrisy. If you're going to call yourself a part of me, you better look like me. Don't, uh, it bothers me when people say they're Christians and then I see, and listen, I'm not, I'm not trying to be the judge and jury, but I have every right as a believer. You call yourself a Christian, we have a right to judge one another to a certain degree. And I have a right to go, you know what, that doesn't look like Jesus. Now, you got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I get it. 
There has to be a consistency between what you say you believe and what you do. Because the church, the world is not going to come into a church that looks hypocrisy, looks full of hypocrisy. It's ugly. It's, it's, it, it turns people's stomachs. And listen, I get it. There's hypocrites sitting in the room right now. You can go anywhere and find hypocrites. If you find me at Walmart, I'm a hypocrite. I don't want to be there. <laughs> I seriously don't. And I, 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 why do we always get on Walmart? I don't care. I don't want to go to Meyer either. I don't, care. I don't want to hate, hate shopping. If you see me there, I don't really want to be there. I'm there because I have to be. I'm really hypocritical. There's hypocrites at the bar. There's some people that are there. They're just drinking. They're just trying to drink. The, they don't really want to be there. There's hypocrites everywhere. You're going to find hypocrites in church. But I'm talking about overall as a body of Christ here at Bethel Worship Center, we want there to be a consistency from what you believe and how you behave on the outside. Because I will tell you the truth, I still get, I still get people that will come to me and go, you go to Bethel? Oh, I remember them. And they'll start talking about the 1980s. I'm going, dude, I don't even know what happened in the 1980s. How are you going to hold that over my head? We're, we we got to build some reputation. I'm going to be honest. The reason the church grew in, in the book of Acts is because what they said they believed, they acted it out every single day. When they said, I, I, we're going to love people where they're at, they actually went out and loved people. Imagine that. Their, their, their preachers, their pastors, their apostles, their fivefold ministers, they didn't just get up and preach. They actually lived what they preach. To the degree that they weren't afraid to say this, imitate me as I imitate Christ. You know, what, you know what modern evangelicalism says right now? Don't look at me, look to Jesus. And it's this, it's, this, it's this false humility. And they're like, oh, no, glorify Jesus. No, the reason why a lot of churches, a lot of church people, a lot of Christians are saying, don't look at me, look at him, is because if, they, if you really scrutinize their life, you'd find that they're not living according to what they're preaching. We've got to get to the point where we're not afraid to say, imitate me. Come walk with me. Come live my life with me. Come into my home. Come into my workplace. I value, I really put a high value on, and I have, a, I have multiple people that have come and worked for me from this church. That did not one time scare me. Not one time. I have coworkers that come work alongside of me that work with me day in and day out. And I'm going to tell you what, I've had some bad moments. We all do, don't we? I'm not afraid to allow them to come work beside me because I know that who I am now, right now, is exactly who I am on Monday. That's who I am. I can't, I, I, that this should be the way we are. And if there's not a consistency between what we're saying and what we're doing, we're turning people away from the gospel. But the church, the church, the early church didn't have that problem. They say, you come imitate me. Come, Paul said, imitate me, 1 Corinthians 11. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's a lot of confidence. And some people go, well, that's pretty arrogant. We're not supposed to be following you, Paul. Paul wasn't saying I'm the Savior. He's saying follow me and I will point you to Christ. If you do what I do, you're going to find Jesus in the middle of it. He's not, it's not an arrogant statement. He's not calling himself the Messiah. He's saying I am confident that if you do what I am doing, you will find yourself growing in Christ. And, there, and, and some of them, you might be in the room right now going, man, if I had somebody come home with me, I don't know. And last week, Pastor Todd talked about it. We want to be the kind of place where we are so vulnerable that I am vulnerable where, with you all, and you are vulnerable with us. I, I, I admit, I've got issues. I've got problems. We've got things going on in our family. It's real. I'm not going to shy away from that. That vulnerability, actually, Pastor Todd, is what brings the healing to the cracks. Because when you confess your sins one to another, what Pastor Todd preached last week, and, I'm not, and, and some, man, sometimes it's not even sin. When you just confess, man, I am going through it right now. I confess that I've got issues in my life. And it may not be sin that's separating you from God. But it could be, and when you confess those things, the church is allowed to come alongside you and pray for you, and the prayers of a righteous man are effective, fervent and effective, and they get a whole lot done is what that means. This is what is going to, the same thing that grew the early church in the first and second century, why it expanded so quickly, the second and third century, were these things right here. Nothing has changed. Absolutely nothing has changed. We still need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit every single day. 
In fact, what I encourage the class when I'm, when I'm teaching this class is you start having relationship with the Holy Spirit. You start talking to him. And you start treating him as a person. You start honoring him every single day because as you start to do that, there comes a power in your life. You're going to do things that you can't do. I do it all the time. There's no, I, I live by Zechariah 4.6. Some of you have come up to me and like you've seen me wear this shirt and you're like, where'd you get that shirt? You need to go see Stephen Shelby. That's my plug for Stephen Shelby. I'm doing so many plugs today. You're welcome, Stephen. Stephen makes shirts. He made a shirt for me. For a while back, I preached, I preached a message about the two trees in Zechariah, and I called it Endless Supply. On the front of my shirt, it says Endless Supply, Zechariah 4.6. I'm connected to two olive trees. I am the, I am the candelabra. And the only, Zechariah 4.6 says it's not by might. It's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. I live my life that way. The only way I can do anything, the only way I have power to even get through a day is because of the power of the Holy Spirit. We still need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. How are we going to grow the kingdom of God in this region? Commitment to prayer. Why don't, you, why don't you do this? Why don't you look at your own life and go, how can I commit more to prayer? In your own personal time. Some, it may look like coming here on Tuesday night. We have Tuesday night prayer. They have set, we have a Thursday night supernatural service. We have Saturday. We have, we have opportunity for you to connect with the body in prayer. But what would it look like if you actually carved time out of your day, every single day, to pray? And I'm not just like, oh, God, I'm really going through it today. I'm talking about relationship with him. Where you, you, you glorify him and then you sit and go, Holy Spirit, what do you want to say to me right now? What would it look like to be committed to prayer like that? What, how would it change our region if the churches in this region made a commitment to prayer again? That's what We can't forsake that. I'm preaching to you today. We cannot forsake the commitment to prayer. We, cannot, we, cannot remember, we have to remember that a lifestyle of humility and compassion brings people in to the kingdom of God. When they see your humility and they see how much you love them, I'm not walking around because I've got a, like I've got a chip on my shoulder and I've got bitterness. I'm walking around in humility. Like Jesus walked around. It's going to draw people in. How devoted are you? Are you and this is, a, this is a tough question. Are you willing to go through hell serving Jesus? Because I'm going I'm to lay it out for you. It's quick. It's true. You know what 2 Timothy says? 2 Timothy says, if all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will endure persecution. Now, listen, we may not go before a government. I pray we never have to. We might not ever be at a, before a firing squad. But one way or the other, we are going to face persecution. Are you, are you fearlessly devoted? Are you, just, are you devoted when it's, are you fair weather? Well, when it's nice, it's good to be a Christian. But boy, when the storms start raging, you know, I just am nowhere to be found. That's a, it needs to be the other way around. No, it actually needs to be that way all the time. When you got storms in your life, this is where you need to be. When you got storms going on in your life, you need to be in relationship with Jesus. And then ask yourself as I'm preaching today, is there really a consistency between what I say and what I do, what I believe and what I behave? Because, and I'll end with this and, and, and we'll pray and we can go home. Paul made it really clear in 1 Corinthians. He said, you can speak in tongues all you want. You can give to the poor all you want. You can give your clothes to those that are needy all you want. You can give your body to be burned. You can die for the cause. But if you don't do it in love, you're a noisy gong. You know what? If you read that in Greek, when you read that passage, it says you're annoying. Wow. Wow. People see through it. People see through your actions, and they see who you really are. I don't want to be annoying to somebody. I want to be so rich to somebody. I want, to, I want them to see Jesus in me so much that they're like, I can't turn away from this dude. I got to follow where he's going. And I want to encourage them. I want to be able to go, yeah, come follow me. Come follow. Don't follow me because I'm your Savior. Follow me. I'll, I'll show you Christ. I have confidence in my life. I have confidence in the way that I live. This is going to transform our region. Stand with me. I want to pray over us. Different service.
Praise God for him. We're following the Holy Spirit. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for every family in this church. And for those that are in this church, that they're, not, they're here. They might have stumbled into here. Don't even know why they're here. Thank you that you brought them here. I pray that, Lord, you would, uh, that you would take this word. It is ministered to me this week. I thank you that, Lord, there is a reformation that's happening in the church. If the prophet Kim Clement in 2015 saw us at the beginning of a reformation stage, I believe that we're still in that, that the church is still being reformed, that you're still recovering this apostolic Christianity because it was so powerful in the early church that people couldn't turn away. I'm reminded, Lord, in the scriptures that after they received the power of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that 3,000 were added to them that day. And those 3,000 that were added on that day, the Bible says the very next day, they were in the house praying. They had a radical transformation. What we want in our community is nothing short of kingdom-building revival, God. We want souls to be so uh, attracted to you, Jesus, not just at Bethel Worship Center, but at every church across this county, God. But I'm speaking to Bethel Worship Center this morning. That God, the, the things that you have spoke to me, these were, these were truths, these were foundational things, oh God, that we needed to go forward with, that we needed to build the kingdom with. Lord, we're, we are embarking on something that is truly amazing. I believe you're taking us places that we've never been before. But I pray that we don't forsake the simple and search for the sensational. God, we want to be devoted to prayer. We want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Our lives need to reflect who you really are, oh God. Let that be true of Bethel Worship Center. And let the people see, let the people on the outside see churches that genuinely love you and genuinely love the world. Because everything, everything that we can do hinges on those two things. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. I believe souls are coming. I believe prodigals are coming home. I believe that you're building a great foundation in our church. And I believe this is part of it, God. In our, in our classes coming up, God, we're, we're going to look at some foundational things some foundational truths to what we believe, oh God. Some things that need to be laid. We need to lay some groundwork, oh God, so we can build. <laughs> we need to, in fact, we are wrong to build without it. Jesus, don't let us move forward until we've laid groundwork. Don't let us move forward. Don't let us get ahead of laying the groundwork and having foundational truths in our lives. Lord, I pray for the individuals in this room, the families. There are, there are some, there's some people in the room that they have taken hard looks as I've been preaching today at how their family dynamic looks, at how it looks in their home, how it looks in their family. And they're trying to make some decisions, oh God, to turn the ship. I pray that you would give them the courage and boldness to do so. Help them begin to set aside prayer with their kids. Help them to set aside prayer with their wives. Help them to set aside prayer. Help them be devoted, oh God, in every single way, oh God, that you're speaking. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for this word. And I thank you that it's falling on good ground. I bless this house. I bless every family. And I pray favor. Just as we were singing that this morning, I was praying it and singing it over the house. May his favor rest upon you and a thousand generations. May, he be, may you be blessed when you come in. And may you be blessed when you go out. May the enemy flee before you seven ways. I pray that over this house. I speak truth. I speak love. And I pray that we go out of this place with an opportunity to reach somebody with the good news of Jesus Christ. In fact, I challenge you, church. I, I'm not praying anymore. I'm not talking to the Lord. I'm talking to you. I challenge you to do what I said here today, that the signs follow you. You know when signs start showing up? They show up when you start preaching the gospel. Well, I'm not a preacher. I'm not an evangelist. I'm not an apostle. You don't have to be. Tell the good news of what Jesus did for you and watch signs and wonders follow where you go.